So this is my old Core XY frame. There are many others like it, but this one is mine. And today I will show you how this will serve as the basis of my next attempt at building a wire-based metal 3D printer. But first, some bad news. The effort to build an SLM printer is dead. If you recall from my last video, I was having difficulty with the trenches forming alongside the deposited metal tracks. And as a result, a couple of you pointed out that the only way to effectively deal with denudation and spatter is by applying positive pressure. This unfortunately called for a complete rebuild of the printer, scrapping most of what I had put together. I did entertain the idea, but for what I had planned, it looked like the price would now break the $5,000 mark. Now $5,000 isn't much in this field, but I am trying to be mindful of the audience I'm catering to, recognising the potential for the cost to scale even further. And then there are the hazards around handling metal powders. Between the hour-long setup times, the inability to recognise exposure, and the volatile nature of some metals, I have been questioning my choices around this. Finally, I have to admit there was an element of personal exhaustion behind this choice as well. I've spent around 18 months passively working away on the printer, and by setting the budget too low, I set the bar too high, meaning that a lot of things had to be redressed rather than being able to progress forward. So at this point, I'm calling it a day. As for what this leaves on the table, perhaps you've seen my first video on a wire-based process. While the outcome was nothing to write home about, it did shine some light on what is possible. I had been thinking about this for some time whilst collecting parts, so while the world's workshop was currently closed for business, I got to work putting together what I had. So this is the main head of the printer. It's comprised of three collimators, three focusing lenses, one aluminium host, and the main stem is from a TIG welding accessory kit. Now you'll probably notice a lot of inconsistencies throughout this video, as I was working on a few ideas simultaneously. But to keep things coherent, I'm going to try and focus on one aspect at a time, ignoring the timeline. Getting back to the setup, driving the head are 330 watt laser modules. Now these are end of life units and as a result are down on power. From what I've measured though, each unit is putting out around 105 watts. To keep them cool, each unit is mounted to a 40 by 40 mm copper heatsink, which should be able to keep them under their maximum operating temperature of 50 degrees Celsius. I've yet to stress test this setup though, but based on my experience with the NUBM38s, it should be capable of doing so. Powering these units, I would eventually use an RD6018, but due to things happening around the globe my order wouldn't come through for a couple of months. So I started off with a basic power supply unit just to get things set up. Eventually I ended up with two RD6018s and finally got a chance to write some code for them. I originally only intended to use a single RD6018 for the printer, but since I had two, I ended up implementing a wire preheater, which I'll touch on in a bit. In regards to wire delivery, the original plan was to continue using 0.25mm stainless steel wire as I had with the original build, but there were problems that prevented this from happening straight away. The syringes used to deliver the wire were now around 150mm in length, and given that the wire is soft and prone to curl, these needed to have a fine tolerance to prevent the wire from curling at the tip. This increased the load on the wire feeder, and given it was a fairly flawed design to begin with, it was just not meant to be. So I had this thing sitting around and I was looking for an excuse to use it. This would bring the wire size up to 0.6mm, increasing the cross-sectional area by nearly sixfold. Despite that, if it would afford me some time to iron out some other issues, I was willing to sacrifice speed for convenience. Since I was now using MIG welding wire, I had the option to use CO2 as a shielding gas. The motivation behind this was mainly cost, as the refill price combined with the additional volume would make for a saving of around 70%. Given this was drawing around 7 litres per minute to begin with, this seemed like an ideal choice. Finally, the wire preheater was a late addition in order to supplement power while using 0.6mm wire. Initially, this would use the second RD6018, but was limited to around 35 watts due to the limited voltage drop. To overcome this, I used a power supply rated at 5V 60A, using the second RD6018 as an interface so I could still control it via G-code. I found that the peak wattage that this could supply was around 50 to 60 watts as the wire would begin to lose form as most of the heat is localised within the wire itself. I also ended up blowing up the power supply at one stage which led to the appearance of this thing. Having too great an inrush current and a potentially dangerous open circuit voltage, it vanished as quickly as it appeared. Unfortunately I couldn't find the parts that I needed to repair the power supply locally, so sacrifices were made and once again it resumed the role of supplying current for the preheater. Before I could get things up and running, there was the issue of alignment. To begin with, I started off using a camera combined with an attenuator to get the beams lined up. Using a red laser pointer as a reference point for the centre, I could get the beams to overlap reasonably well. 
However, what I couldn't do was ensure that this was happening at the correct focal length. As this cheap camera auto corrects for exposure, the spot size is never consistent, and since I couldn't disable this, I was never 100% certain whether the beams were at their narrowest. The next issue to reveal itself would be the physical alignment of the wire, as the stalk is tensioned with the grub screw and the tolerances are a bit more than I would like them to be. This led to a pretty noticeable offset, but thanks to my own bodged handiwork and with enough swearing, I could get things aligned. Eventually I would replace the tip with something properly centred, making it now impossible to align, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. The first few runs of the machine would be hit and miss. Preheating the wire would prove its worth, but other issues would reveal themselves. Because I had resorted to using 0.6mm wire, if the feed rate wasn't correct, the wire had the capacity to pull or push the head out of focus, destabilising the run. You can see the effect of the beams being split apart, and how far off centre the wire delivery could be. This was mainly caused by the support bracket being overly flimsy as I had just made it from some scrap, expecting to use much finer wire. I ended up getting a stronger bracket cut but it would be nearly two weeks before I got my hands on it, so I persisted with what I had. Now I spent far more time on this than I would like to admit. Even after replacing the support bracket, eliminating play in the carriages, and providing additional support to the head, I could not get reliable results. There would be the odd flash in the pan, sometimes effectively wetting the base material, but for the many mishaps, there were consequences, usually resulting in damaged fibres from reflections, shutting the machine down for a couple of days. One of the issues simply related to there not being enough power, resulting in the base material not heating effectively. And the answer to this would come in the form of these. Now this would push the potential power up to 600 watts, but was held back by the power supply unit, so realistically only afforded another 135 watts. Now 450 watts may sound like a lot, but many commercial machines run over 10 times this, accommodating wire sizes of over a millimetre. However, they often run spot sizes in the order of millimetres, keeping in mind the beam profile is typically non-linear. There is however one prominent manufacturer pulling this off with one tenth the power, even using off-axis lasers. But this comes at the price of speed, and despite the benefits regarding reflections, this was not a compromise I wanted to make. So the second and most prominent issue relates to the effect of spot size. The choice of focal lengths I had made favoured a higher power density, recognising the relatively low laser power. But this translated to a spot size of just over 0.3mm for each channel, originally yielding around 1200 watts per millimetre squared for each focused beam. This made more sense in the context of finer wires, but because I had opted to use 0.6mm wire, I had really set myself up for a challenge. With the beams grouped together, I would typically measure a naked track width of just under 1mm. Good enough for finer wires, but not for what I was trying to do. While defocusing the beams was an option, I was already limited to 10mm per second, so the writing was on the wall. The 0.6mm wire had to go. Returning to fine wire, I began by making a new wire feeder. Equally as janky as the first, but this time better acknowledging the limitations of plastic. The runout on the main roller was nearly that of the wire's width, but the plastic body compensated for this well performing far better than my first design. I had also taken delivery of some 0.2mm spring steel, annoyingly coated in oil and without a reel, but nonetheless would allow me to continue using CO2 as a shielding gas. The next thing to deal with was the never-ending issues around wire alignment. Now despite my efforts, I wasn't getting anywhere, so I decided to adopt a different strategy. And it would come in the form of this, a dial indicator mount, although this would mean returning to a side entry approach. But the freedom of adjustment this would afford and the fringe benefit of getting to keep my sanity, well it seemed like the right move. To make life a bit easier on myself, I would drop the opposing laser head, but at least I could run two of the three lasers at max power. I also ended up routing the gas line through the centre of the head. Providing I could keep the lenses from being contaminated, there was also the potential to bring the gas feed closer to the weld pool, lowering consumption. So with all of this in mind, it's now time to see how it performed. So the first run didn't amount to much, but the second actually managed to deposit a nice bead of steel. As you can see, there's quite a bit of carbon, and that was largely due to this. Now as to what caused this, well clearly it's the presence of oxygen. But as to why, well it took me a few runs to figure out. To cut a long story short, it was basically a combination of these two things. By placing a large body near the centre point of flow, I had created a pressure imbalance, drawing air into the weld. Even with the welding tip retracted and the feed angle adjusted, the deflection caused by the syringe would still create this effect to some extent. 
This might suggest a significantly lower amount of gas can be used, once the lenses are protected, but for the meantime, I'll simply lift the gas line and maintain the same flow rate. At the same time, I was also trying to figure out the limitations of this setup. I tried printing a square and was surprised at how well it deposited metal. You can see there were still some issues around shielding and how the wire pushed through the weld pool whilst moving into it, but overall it seemed far more capable than I initially expected. I was also messing around with different feed rates. To try and get an idea of how they translated to layer height, I performed quite a few runs also testing out how the layers would stack up, and the results were mixed. At this point, all I can say is that the wall thickness was around 0.8mm, the layer height was around 0.25mm, and the speed was limited to around 25mm per second. Something noteworthy is the formation of a ball on the end of the wire as the layers increase, as it broadens the track size, draws material away from the tail and adds it to the beginning of each pass. I'm not 100% certain what the answer to this is, but do realise that excess heat, surface tension and gas flow play a role in it. Unsurprisingly, passes without retraction suffered less from this effect. Really at this point I was just messing around to get a feel for things, and then this happened, which was about a week into having things finally up and running, but at this stage I decided to stop and make a video. I've been delaying this as I wanted to have something else up and running to take the place of the SLM printer, and now it's finally there. What I will say is that for what this sacrifices in resolution, it gains in simplicity and scalability although the process itself is deceptively simple. So as of now, I need to re-terminate a fibre, finish off the second version of the head, but next on the list is improving the visual feedback as that will eliminate a lot of the guesswork. So that's where I'm leaving things for now. Anyway, thanks for watching.